Good afternoon. Welcome to Art Basel Miami Beach Conversations. My name is Edward Winkleman, and we're very pleased to see all of you here today. Thank you for coming. And thank you to everybody who's watching on Facebook Live. Uh, before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we'll ask for the safety of everyone if you could please keep your mask on. Um, I'll put mine back on in just a second. We're having a conversation today and, okay, about 21st century collectors, the meeting of tech and art. And two of our panelists happen to personify that in their profession and or their passions. So closest to me, we have Ethan Beard, who is the co-founder and CEO of Yaws, which is a startup focused on building communities through ownership and NFTs. Next to him is Sarah Wendell Sherrill, co-founder and co-CEO of Lobus, an ownership platform on a mission to make artists owners. And we're very lucky to have this conversation moderated by the art business editor from Art News, one of the most astute observers and writers about the contemporary art market, Tim Snyder. Please join me in giving them all a very warm welcome. Thanks, Ed. Hey, everybody. So just to frame out the conversation a little bit more before we get started. About a decade ago, give or take, the traditional art world became obsessed with this idea of the tech collector, which was this like, semi-mythical creature that people would talk about who was like a relatively young person who had made a bunch of money in Silicon Valley in some capacity and might be really interested in buying a lot of artwork, but was either like very early on in that process or maybe hadn't even started it yet. And there was and still is a lot of conversation out there about how to connect with this particular demographic. And the orthodoxy that emerged pretty quickly was this idea that, oh, well, they're not going to be interested necessarily in the same types of artwork as people who come from traditional collecting backgrounds or whatever. Like, they might need to buy things that have like drones in them, or like they're all going to, they only want to collect things that have code. Um, it's, it, Kind of, to me, sounds a little silly at certain points, but that's like, I won't editorialize too much. Um, but the idea was that, okay, if we can find the right types of work to connect with this group, we can pretty much do everything else the same way that we've always done it. We can offer them the same opportunities, we can sort of go through the same processes and everything will be cool. And I think that several years on, the success of that approach has been limited. And it's tough to say because you're always just sort of operating off of limited information. But from my own reporting and research into this, it seems like if there is anything that connects this kind of, I think, still very nebulous group of people, um, I will call them tech-fluent art lovers, I think that they tend to gravitate more towards the idea of finding new ways to expand people's engagement with the arts, the types of ways that people can support the arts through technology, and then it's much more about that than about like finding the right type of artwork. Um, but this is just an assumption, and I am fortunate today to have two people who are much closer to all this than I am to help me stress test my own conclusions about this. So Sarah, Ethan, thank you for being here. Thank you for being our spirit guides through this. Very strange world. So let's just start with the broadest possible question. This idea of like the tech collector, I'm assuming that you've heard this before. Like what's your standpoint on it as people who theoretically like fit this profile? Do you think it actually speaks to anything that, that is substantial or do you think like maybe it's doing more damage than it's doing good? Am I gonna take this? Okay. Go for it. Are we tech collectors? I it's a are good we? question. I think maybe. Um, well, Ethan and I are both from San Francisco, so I think it's. Uh, and I, well, I'm not gonna. It's, it, Ethan can have his response on this, but you know, I think yeah, to to sort of label and generalize any sort of behavior into one is always a bit of a risk, um, and I think what you're seeing with the the sort of adoption of the NFT market is, is really something that is aligned with an ethos of the next generation, which is to say, you know, rather than, and, and I, I love 
physical works. Um, I live with paintings and works on paper and sculpture. Um, but I also, you know, love the promise of the future of NFTs, and it's it's sort of a digital. You know, if you're about community building, right, and and the art world is about connecting to communities, connecting to artists. For people that are building tools, building the world, building the infrastructure in technology, you know, you you want to have an experience that's in that. And the NFT world is basically, you know, you're not walking into your living room anymore and saying. Like, Tim, what an amazing collection you have. You're walking into Twitter, and it's like, look at my collection. So there is there is a bit of a, you know, I think what we are, there are a lot of interesting things to learn as to what's happening in the NFT world um, as to the behavior and what's interesting and what's not. Um, but I think there's a lot of questions you could begin to go down. But I think it's, you know, the the tech community is one of the more culturally curious communities that are out there. And I think if we're seeing anything from this week where those communities are really coming together around the topic of, of art, of NFTs, of digital, um, you know, that's, it's, they're there. And I will just say for the record that even before we got into NFTs and crypto, you would never walk into my home and be like, Tim, you have an amazing collection. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> Not for lack of desire, to be clear, but lack of resources more so. Um, Ethan, <laughs> would you like to add anything to this? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, if you were to try to stereotype tech collector, you would probably point to someone like me, because I've spent my career in tech decades now um, and love art and passionate about art and, and kind of myself and my, my wife and my family are, are very passionate about it. Um, I think it's probably pretty limiting to try to think of like a tech collector as a something that you can stereotype and draw a box around. Um, it's kind of like saying like, oh, there's a lot of people who've made money in real estate. Let's go find the real estate collector. Maybe they want pictures of buildings or I don't know, art, architectural drawings or something. Um, and tech, to your point, is like very culturally curious, also very culturally diverse, um, and now is is massive. And so uh, we did see, you know, to your point, Tim, in the past kind of five or ten years. You know whether it's galleries um, or fairs coming to Silicon Valley, kind of like what, what's the art that's going to resonate here? Um, and I think that kind of fell flat. Um, but I do think you're seeing a, a growing number of people from coming from tech um, who are interested in art, interested in supporting art. You know, I do think one thing that the tech world loves is like we 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 all build startups, so we're looking for like things that can grow and things that can have impact. Um, and I think art is obviously a place art and artists. Um, that can reach large numbers of people that can have a broad influence. And so I think that aspect of it is is appealing to kind of the tech collector, if anything. But I think they look like most people generally. Yeah, Sarah, you mentioned this idea of community, which is like a, a buzzword that's not buzzword, but but a word that's been very prevalent in my own sort of investigations into the crypto side of the world. Like everybody who has anything to do with the blockchain just uses the word community constantly. And it's really struck me that there is just like an overwhelming amount of optimism in the space. Like the only place I've been in certainly the past like two years, let alone longer than that, where I'm like, oh, people actually think, think things can get better here. Like there's a real optimism around it. And the traditional art world in a lot of ways um, has, for me at least, moved in the opposite direction where people are just like really cynical about a lot of things. They just believe that the system has a lot of issues in it. And I'm just wondering if we're talking about trying to find ways that these two worlds can talk to each other better, like how do you account for the difference in outlook? And how do you think that maybe one side can help the other or vice versa in that? Well, and, and the, there, you know, I think what's interesting that this talk is sort of if we think about like collecting in the 21st century and to what Ethan is saying and what community is sort of getting at is is this this sort of like era of the artist right and and I think our generation I think what's attractive to maybe this cohort if you were ever to generalize is to say a connection to the artist right and that you know I think what you are seeing in the community building that's happening is that there is a direct relationship with the creator, right? There is a direct relationship to their practice, their process. Um, who else is sort of like in their tribe, so to speak? 
And that's not an experience that you have necessarily, that has been, you know, been able to sort of grow in the traditional ecosystem um, when you're really talking about object-based works. And you might go to a dinner and you might meet other collectors, but it's a very, you know, it's a very laborious process to sort of unearth what that, that sort of community might look like. Um, and what's happening sort of in the, in the digital space, and it, it could be, you know, Tom Sachs' amazing rocket launch that's happening tomorrow, right? But there is a whole community on Discord and Twitter and Instagram, I think, a little bit there, for in and around his practice. You're hearing directly from him, connecting with him. Um, and that's, I think, we are, I, I think we're, you know, and the work that that we collect personally are all artists that we have had the chance to meet. Um, and that's not something that everybody sort of has the, the privilege or benefit of doing. Um, we now can kind of facilitate that in, a, in the 21st century. And I think that's what's really underlying this idea of community. Um, that, you know, whether it's CryptoPunks or it's Tom Sachs or Lucian Smith is doing a seeds drop where, you know, he's really like bringing a group in to help grow the next generation. Like these are the concepts that I think people are really gravitating towards that are exciting. So what you're kind of nodding to there is this idea that with the types of technological advances that we've seen in of course the past several years, like it really has given artists, uh, creators, et cetera, more autonomy, more a more direct connection to their supporters, to their fans. Um, whereas in a, in a more traditional, certainly gallery ecosystem, it felt like the idea was, well, like my dealer can handle that. And like maybe you'll see the collectors at the dinner or the opening or whatever else. I mean, sure, like you're doing studio visits and all that kind of stuff. Um, but it was much more, I think, removed and I, from my perspective, it does seem like technology has changed the, almost the communication relationship, um, which has to have ripple effects, I would think, much, much deeper into things. Well, and I think if we even just think about what Instagram has done mm -hmm. to that and to our relationship with the creator, with the artist, you know, you now have a, a somewhat, I mean, it's not the Web3 promise, but it's the, you know, of of some sort of dialogue with them directly. Um, if you kind of go back in art history, like that was, you know, that was a book before, right? That was an exhibition. That was a very one-way conversation. Social media, you know, and Instagram created a very visual connection, a dialogue. You could follow, you could get information. And now I think we've just like, we're entering the sort of an era where that is just going to get magnified, um, and I think as people that are sort of in the space, I, I'm I'm very excited about what that begins to look like. Um, yeah, I mean, I think if you look at technology broadly over the past number of decades, like it is a force of democratization and disintermediation and the removal of gatekeepers. Um, you know, if we just go back to the early days of the internet. You know, or like when I was growing up, there were three three stations on the TV. Like if you wanted to watch TV or you wanted to get your video out to the world, you had to go talk to one of the three major networks. Okay, fast forward now, you, like anybody can publish. This is being broadcast immediately live. We didn't have to ask anybody's permission. We just go on to one of these platforms. Um, and that's happening across every form of, uh, of media and business where gatekeepers are removed and this democratization of access to the tools to be able to get your message out, get your creative uh, output out to the world. Um, and I think what's really interesting, I mean, the art world is arguably has like the biggest gatekeepers and the smallest community and kind of the most, uh, you know, it, it's like very hard to break into. Um, and what you're seeing finally, I think, with things like crypto and NFTs is actually figuring out how do we actually democratize the world of art? You know, how can anyone be an artist? Um, you don't have to be hung on a wall here to be able to do that. You don't have to have representation from a, you know, a very amazing New York City gallery and hang on a very expensive wall in Chelsea. You know, through the internet, you can actually now access, you know, collectors or artists uh, anywhere around the world. So I think that's like, it's, it's a change that we've seen come through lots of different, we've seen it overturn a lot of different things. Um, and I think we're kind of knocking on the door of art at this point. Well, what that 
speaks to on some level is the idea that as these technologies change, as the processes around them change, there's obviously going to be a group of people who see that happening and who lean into that. And then there are going to be a group of people who are either not thinking about it, not recognizing it, or at least not taking advantage of it. And it seems like there's a divide that can open up pretty quickly. And there are good things about that and bad things about that, um, depending on who you are. It, and before we actually got up here on stage, Ethan, like a week or so ago, when we were talking about this panel, we were discussing the idea that in the uh, crypto economy, the NFT market right now, you have these sort of early adopters of the technology people, whether it's Beeple or it's Xcopy or Pock or whoever else. And these artists sell for multiples in the NFT world of what, say, a Tom Sachs or somebody who has like a very high profile in the traditional art world does. And it, I don't know, from my perspective, it's like, well, you have a group of artists that people who are really interested in these new ways of doing things, they feel like they have a relationship, they're excited about this new way. And then the people who haven't really gotten on board with that, they kind of don't care that much. Um, do you think that that's, that's an accurate way of looking at it? Or, and, and like, what are the implications of that going forward? I think it's fairly accurate. Um, you know, cryptocurrency is fascinating. If we think about, just say, Bitcoin at the highest level, which I assume most people are reasonably familiar with, like, in some ways, value is a belief system. Like, the only reason that anything has value is because we all believe that it has value. And if we don't believe that it has value, then it doesn't have value. You can't just, like, ascribe value to something. Like, we have to collectively agree upon it. Um, and in many ways, what happened with Bitcoin is that the people who believed in Bitcoin, like, through sheer force of their belief and their will, willed it into value and created what, billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars of value that we can all say, though, I don't think it's worth anything, but like, there's enough people that believe it's worth something that it is worth something. Um, and so in many ways, I think like the, the world of cryptocurrency, like it wants to be seen, it wants to express its belief. The people that are there want to say like, no, I, this, is, this is something of value, and it's a value because we collectively as this community around it have decided that it's a, it's a value. Um, and I think what you see with the world of NFTs and artists that are creating NFTs is kind of that same expression where it's the crypto community, which I'll use very loosely because it's global and it's not defined, um, but wants to ascribe value to the world that is crypto, wants to express that value uh, and, and do that, wants to create this belief system. And the way that it is expressed is through saying like, no, these artists, we can decide this art is worth something. We've done it with Bitcoin. It was nothing but a number in a computer and we decided it's worth whatever, $60,000 of Bitcoin, um, we can decide that this artist, Beeple, um, or X Copy, like, we can decide they're worth millions, and no one can kind of stop it. Um, and so I think that's a lot of what you see, rather than saying, like, oh, we want acceptance in this world where, you're like, the traditional world decides value. It's really, it's, it's the technologists and the culture around crypto saying, like, no, no, we actually can do this on our own. We actually want to ascribe this belief system uh, that creates value in these things. But I, I, I will just add to, I think this concept of the early adopter is important. I mean, every cycle has it. And I think we're in this movement of, you know, kind of like CDs to streaming. And, you know, there are a lot of reasons why people are selling for what, I mean, there's, you know, people that have held crypto for a while. There's this, you know, conference of the, this is my, you know, this is my tribe. This is my status. Um, but I think if you fundamentally peel it back, I think we're moving what what NFTs is allowing um, is for us to move sort of to an object-based system to a sort of people-based system. So all of a sudden you're, you know, I think we're gonna see, and we're seeing this, whether it's the Constitution DAO or it's CryptoPunks or it's, um, you know, sort of any other, you know, even Derek Adams' NFT that he he dropped this week, like, you are sort of able to participate in that creator. And there are going to be early adopters that, like, go there and understand it, um, just like there were early adopters in the music space that, you know, felt very comfortable in that. Um, and it's, you know, I think if an artist and not every artist is the same, right? Like, just like every collector is not the same, but if an artist cares about 
community, you're like reaching a broad audience, which is why museums, you know, that, that's a very important foundational thing for artists and museums and that relationship. If they care about distribution, reach, community, you know, building their audience, having their work seen, like this is an undeniable sort of technology and force that is coming, you know, at, at creators and, you know, to what Ethan said, we're now in this world where, and there's some really, really great podcasts and talks on this, but like you could be a creator and have a community of a thousand that you're directly connecting with and like you'll make a good living and you'll have, you know, your work will be seen, it'll be um, consumed and you're not needing to just talk to, you know, the, the sort of specific industry in New York or LA, it's, you know, it's really the world um, and it's, yeah. So I think early, the early adopter mentality is an important one to remember too. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, Timmy, you and I were talking a little bit about this, uh, and I don't know the exact numbers. I did some research earlier in the year, but if you look at a traditional gallery, I think it's something on the order of like 50 clients yeah. that they have. So literally like their entire business is hung up, is like built off, the, off of 50 customers. It's a tiny, tiny number. Um, but even as small as that number is, if you go to end, most artists and ask them like, hey, how often do you talk to the people who own your art? They, they probably can't even tell you who owns their art, which is kind of remarkable. Like, if there's only 50 customers, it should be pretty easy to actually, like, connect them. Uh, but that's just not the way that the world has worked. And I think what we, we're seeing with, like, crypto and tech is, you know, that direct relationship where, like, an artist can actually know who their, like, know their tribe, know their community, know their collectors, know their supporters, can have a relationship. And that relationship doesn't mean, hey, you have to buy a piece of art and hang it on the wall. That a relationship can actually have, like, more granular ways to actually understand even just the relationship of, like, hey, I like what you're doing. I like your art. No, I can't afford it, but, like, I want to be supportive and, and part of your group. And I think from the numbers perspective, I mean, again, 50 client, 50 customers, 50 clients, and an artist, if, you know, in a prolific year, they have maybe 100 pieces, maybe, like, 100 pieces that they create, and that is a, you know, and maybe in their lifetime, they have 200 collectors, right? And, but, you know, then you look at their social media following, and they might have 100,000, which again, in the Taylor Swift and Beyonce model, it might not be astronomical numbers, but it's way more than 100, right? And now there is a mechanism for those 100,000 people to actually like sort of be owners, uh, participate, collect in that artist practice. And you're, you just are the, these multiples of, of reach and distribution like is, is what, tech has been built on and um, it's sort of entering the cultural sphere in a way that feels very native and very natural um, and not perverse like right very comfortable um. yeah and that's again I think that all these are important points because they speak to this idea that again to go back to that that idea of the tech collector and this this very reductive notion of oh the thing that we need to do is find people who are making work that will connect with an audience. And what we're talking about here up right now is this idea of, well, there's the work that you do as an artist, and then there's the conversation around it and how you build support for it, how you build consensus, how you relate to people around it. And those are two, I, I mean, they're obviously linked processes, but they're also very different processes. And from my experience, both working on the gallery side and then as a reporter, like there are definitely there are artists who are very interested in the idea of, of controlling or, or really putting a lot of effort into both sides. And then there are also people who are like, I really just want to spend time in the studio. I don't want to network. The last thing I want to do is think about like checking my Twitter DMs or even having a Twitter or an Instagram or whatever else. Um, and that, I think, is part of the reason why we're at this kind of inflection point from, from my perspective. And I don't know, it's, it's um, I don't even really have a question attached to this. I'm just sort of musing about it well, in real but time. I'll kind of riff off of what you're saying because I think we are, as founders of technology companies, like we have the ability to participate in our upside, right? We create something, we're not, you know, we build value over time and, and with that, you know, we sort of, and we have supporters along the way. Artists don't operate in that way. And I, 
Um, I am personally very excited. I think we are, you know, I think if we think about collecting in the 21st century, whether it's digital, whether it's physical, whether it's experiential, um, whether it's museum philanthropy in some way, shape, or form, um, but that you're kind of like going into business with the artist. And, and this is not to say that, that the traditional structures don't exist. Um, you know, the galleries play a really, really vital role, um, the right kind of galleries, right? I think those that are, and, and you're, you know, I think what does it look like to actually have, you know, be, be sort of in business with the artist, right? Like, and I think this is a trajectory that we're moving towards, and I will, you know, this is slightly controversial, but I, I'm happy to have an artist hold back like equity on their painting. Like I would love that, in fact. And I think what that facilitates is there there's like a dialogue and communication flow. Like, you know, I we would acquire a work, we would know where that artist is showing next. We would know, you know, what other projects they're working on. Um, it's you know it's the way that you sort of stay connected to to your network um, and you know I think with all of the amazing work that's being done in the NFT space, I think we're headed towards that world. So. Yeah, I mean, part of me wonders as I was listening to you talk to him is, you know, I wonder if the question is not how do we find the tech collector, but how do we find the young collector, mm. right? Like, how do we identify young people yeah. and bring them on board? And of course, there are artists who don't want Twitter. There are probably artists who don't use email. Um, but like increasingly that's not going to be the case, right? Like there's no, nobody under the age of 20 who like doesn't use a phone. Um, so by the time they're artists who are 80, they're probably still going to be using their phone. They may probably going to be using Twitter. Um, and so, you know, I think increasingly it's, it's how do you find the billions of people on this planet that are young, but are living their lives digitally, right? You live all, I get my screen time reports. I think I spend three hours a day on my phone. I bet most people in this room are somewhere along the same lines. It's kind of shocking. Uh, but that's like, that's where your life is. Like your life is on your phone. We live our lives digitally. Like who we are, who we communicate with, how we communicate with them is entirely taking place on screens for better or for worse. Like we can, there's definitely downsides to that. And I love being face to face with people. It gives me just huge amounts of energy. Uh, but then I'm going to walk out and look at my phone. Um, and so, so, you know, I think what we see, and again, I don't want to spend like nerd out too much on NFTs, although I could, but like that is all about like if I live my life on my phone, why don't I want my art on my phone? Like why do I want to buy art and hang it on my wall that no one sees? Literally like you could have it in a room in your house that you never go into. And so literally like three people a year may see that piece of art. Like that's kind of crazy. Like why, why do you want that? Like this is the internet. Like put it on my phone, put it on the internet. Let's let uh, anyone on the planet see the output of these amazing artists um, is kind of a like logical place to kind of bring the world when you're thinking about tech natives and you're thinking about kind of youth. And on one of the best analogies I've heard of sort of like the, what this next gen might think about is somebody compared owning a crypto punk with going, saying, you know, going to Harvard, right? And what that badge on your LinkedIn, and I'm not saying anything about the educational system. I love education, and, and it's, but I think the, the social signifier of what it means to culturally identify with something digitally and online and say, I am an alumni of this, I'm, I'm an alumni of this school, but I'm also a collector and in the community of this project, I think is starting to have equal weight. And I think that's what's really exciting is that you hear 20 year olds talk about culture in a way that they never had before. Um, so I think, yeah, young, next gen or young gen who the, who's coming is, is kind of should be the question rather than tech. Ethan, I would just like to say that there, I had a moment a second ago when you were like, oh, well, I spend three hours on my phone a day. And I was like, oh my God, Ethan only spends three hours on his phone. I feel so. Oh. <laughs> In seriousness, though, uh, this, uh, the, so what, what both of you are speaking to is a question that I think about a lot, both in terms of my own work and in terms of the art world, which is always like, well, who do you want your audience to be? And again, there are, there's a set of people who are very happy with the idea of saying like, I, I just want to have the smallest amount of people that I can sort of have a relationship to and I can have support in my work and I don't want to expand it. I don't care if I'm known worldwide. And that's totally fine if that's what you want. But if 
in general, I think that most artists want their work to be seen by the largest amount of people that they can. I, I feel pretty good making that generalization. Um, but as you're saying, like the, the tools that we have now for achieving that goal and what the end result looks like is just radically different now than what it was 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I don't think that the, like the fundamental endpoints of all this are that different. Like Sarah, when you're saying that now with NFTs, like you're in, you can go in, into business with the artist, like you were always going into business with the artist if you were buying one of their paintings. Like this is why when I try to explain the art market to people who don't have any connection to it, like I, the thing that I always tell them that like blows their mind, I'm like, what you have to understand is that if you have a young artist who doesn't have much exposure, you would rather, as a dealer, sell their painting to a name collector who's like a trustee in a museum for a 40 or 50% discount than you would rather sell it to like somebody who doesn't have a profile in the art world for full price. And people are like, what are you talking about? That makes no sense. I'm like, no, 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 no. But like, that's how you build a consensus around things, right? And so, again, we're just doing the same things now, but they're, like the scale goes up. Um, and in terms of, I think that one of you mentioned the idea of like institutions before, or at least this idea of like how many people are seeing the work. Like even when you're saying, oh, only three people a year other than me might see your work if I buy it. Um, you are both involved in traditional institutions too. Um, for instance, I, I believe the ICA San Francisco, which is coming into being as we speak right now. Um, how is this like informing your standpoint on how to approach that institution or others that you're involved with? Like, how does how do you think differently about the museum because of the types of things that we're talking about here? Yeah, I think those are they're great points. Um, we're involved with both San Francisco SF MoMA as well as ICA SF. Um, and one of the things that we always support with SF MoMA is actually the public facing art, the art that's in the lobbies, the art that's free for anyone to see. Um, like that's a part where we, we feel passionate that like the art shouldn't be locked up behind a $20 ticket. Um, and so there's a bunch of things that SF MoMA has done in letting you know, people under age 18 in or having a day, a day a month where anybody from San Francisco can come in for free. Um, so it's something that I feel passionate about is that our, our, both artists want their art to be seen, people want to see art, um, putting it behind closed doors, whether those are you know institutional doors or private doors, is kind of doing a disservice to both of those people. Um, ICASF is a new museum that we're launching, um, hoping to open the doors uh, first half of next year. And one of the things that I get excited about, and this, I could talk about ICASF for a long time, uh, but it's we're a non-collecting institution, so we're not buying art and storing it in some warehouse somewhere and spending our money on like. I mean, in some ways, like a museum is where great art goes to die, right? Like a museum buys it and you, no one ever sees it again. It's just like it's in some warehouse someplace and there's a file someplace that says like, oh, we own this art. You're like, okay, great, what's that doing? Um, so both like the money spent on buying it, the money spent on storing it, conserving it. Now I think it's great that there are institutions to do that, um, but with ICASF specifically, like we are not acquiring art, uh, we are showing art and our goal is to show you know, art that's uh, representative of the community, um, that is diverse in terms of who is creating the art, diverse in terms of who's seeing the art, um, and not about, you know, what's our accessions committee look like and how much money do we need to raise to, to acquire something and, and own it, not around ownership. And all, you know, and so my husband and I are also involved with SF MoMA, and I am involved with Noguchi and Cap Street, which are both artist-run organizations. And I think the the sort of ethos of ICA that has really been so powerful is that it is an artist space, right? And the I think the cohort that it is attracted, and I think for the reason of not having to raise, have a certain capital campaign to care for a collection, right, um, to be, you know, have a registrarial department, it really affords a lot of creative freedom. Um, and Ali Gass, who is the director there, is, is one of the more innovative, I think, forward-thinking, nimble-minded um, curators and directors out there, um, and really understanding what that relationship to art and artists means and looks like. 
Um, and I think it's testament to the to the really incredible group that she's kind of pulled together, who are who who come from other in, sort of innovative um, backgrounds. And that's not speaking, but it's just it's a it's a really um, diverse group, I think, as as Ethan pointed out. Um, and I think we are in this era where you have to ask the question of what is the role of an institution, right? And and how does an institution you know, both reach an audience that is local and is very responsible to that to that community, but also, you know, shares the mission of of the artists that they work with broadly and widely. Um, I think COVID was such an interesting time to watch all of that happen, and Moad, which is an incredible museum in San Francisco, um, they did such sort of. Uh, unbelievable programming that was all of a sudden able to be streamed, right? And so their audience, I believe, from what I've heard, like, you know, went beyond San Francisco and really, like, you know, kind of became global. And I think I saw that certainly in different panels and lectures um, that I was a part of during that time. And I think this is, again, like this experience of information sharing and thought sharing that you know museums help shepherd and do the storytelling. Um, but when it's not constrained, you know, there's a lot of, and we're heading into, we are in the 21st century, we're heading into a world where there is a global currency and there is a digital life that you have and you know you are connected to people all over the world you know how does a museum play you know what do, what is their role when they've been sort of regional by design i think those are all great questions and and they also i think sort of they have an impact more than ever i think on on the private side of things too uh, like Ethan, when you're talking about the all the the sort of overhead of maintaining a collection at an institution, like obviously you have that if you have more art than you can fit in your home at one point, which is actually a definition that people have used with me in the past. They're like, oh, the difference between a buyer and a collector is that you, if you're if you're a collector, you have more art than can fit on your walls at any one time. I'm like, thanks, great, love it. Um, <laughs> But you're going to be canceled. <laughs> hey, man, this is this is why I no longer work in a gallery. I can just be a, every. I'm a journalist. Every, nobody likes me anyway. So it's like. <laughs> Anyhow, um, but this idea of of like we've talked a lot in a sort of thematic way about this idea of of patronage changing on a personal level, not just on an institutional level, in this new technological ecosystem. But I don't think that we've really, aside from mentioning NFTs, really talked about like what forms that takes for a collector, say, or a, let's throw out the word collector, but for like an, a private art patron. So what else does that look like now that maybe it couldn't look like in the past? Patronage, are you yeah. asking? Yeah. What forms can it take? How can you use technology to do it differently other than, say, just buying NFTs? Are there things that you know of that you're, you're excited about or think are interesting? Well, I'm going to say that we throw out the whole language of patronage. Okay. So this is going to slightly contra But I, like, I really struggle with the word collector and the word patron and the word, you know, I think. And, and I, you know, I'm, I'm very excited for, like, a future where when we talk about owners of art, we actually, like the first thing that comes to mind is actually the artist. And this is, you know, I think language is so powerful in all of, I mean, as we see with, with sort of our life in general right now and how you label things and how you term things and how you conceptualize things. Um, like why, why is it that, that, you know, the owner of a, of a piece is actually like not the artist, right? And I think, there is economic sort of structures that need to change along with that in order to to sort of empower that. But one of the things that I always find the most fascinating, um, and somebody can correct me if this has changed, you know, in the last bit. But basically, an artist makes a donation to a museum, uh, or and their their write off is the cost of goods. A collector, same painting donates it and it's $110 million. 
So that is, and you understand maybe why it exists and the market is opaque and price, you know, anybody can say, oh, here's a canvas and it's worth you know, 500,000 and please give me my tax write off for that. But like that in and of itself is like that, that sort of needs to be rethought, right? How do you actually have, um, and without naming any specific artists, but like why is that the case? And how do you actually have, um, when a donation is made to a museum of an amazingly valuable piece, you know, to have it be like the artist is as important to that donation as the, as the collector, patron, buyer of the work um, is to that institution. And I think we're still a far way away from reconciling that, part of which is because institutions rely on a lot of cash donations to survive. Um, and there's, you know, that's an inherent tension that I don't know how we fix that necessarily. Um, but I think it's, it needs to sort of be, you know, language needs to be inverted in that space. Yeah, and that's, that's as true, I think, on the, the market side of things as it is on the institutional side. I mean, we were talking about the whole idea of artists not having a resale royalty right in the US. And so if you have an artist whose career explodes in a good way, and next thing you know, their works are being flipped at auction, and, and the piece that they sold originally for fifteen or $20,000 suddenly is, is getting 10 or 100 times that at auction. Um, you'll have these moments where there'll be this huge price, and everybody in the room will start clapping. And you're like, who are we clapping for in this situation? It, it, it is very much this idea of like, oh, well, now there's somebody else who's decided that there's, like, this is worth a lot of money. They are now going to own this thing, but the artist isn't going to see anything off of that. Like, their, their career will be helped in a, an indirect sense, uh, but they're not going to get any direct proceeds from that. No, and I think, again, like, if you think the auction business is a 250-year-old business, right? The business of working with living artists is a relatively recent phenomenon. And the idea of working with artists that have made work in the last five years, year, is like a recent phenomenon. But I think there was a, and the clapping and the, that you and I have talked about this, like there was an, a British artist who, you know, made, it painted a painting 2020 that was sold this past summer. Um, you know, you can kind of like do the math maybe to say that you know, maybe it was the original sale in 2020 was somewhere around like 40,000 pounds and it sold for 3 million pounds. I think that figure is right. And, you know, less a gallery commission, less the insurance that that artist has to pay, less their studio space, all of the costs, you know, they're kind of making 30 cents on the dollar. And so there's now this like shortfall of 2.9 million which by the way in our world would never be acceptable like where that money is like sort of just like left in the world and I, I wrote something about it and I got a couple of like DMs back that um, people are like, well, no, but there's a draw to sweet. Like there's a resale royalty. The resale royalty is capped at 12,500 pound, pounds, I think, or maybe euros. Um, sure, that's nice. Um, that's not 2.9 million pounds. So there is, you know, I think really unpacking what this means. Um, and, you know, I think we're, we're in an era where those are, there's like a lot more of a direct dialogue about what's behind those and the, the creators they impact and, you know, the lives that they impact. Um, you know, it shouldn't be that an artist that is able to sell a work for a million dollars is worried about rent and their child's daycare. Um, and I think hopefully, we're, you know, with NFTs, with, with sort of, well, anyway, I think, I think we're in an era where we are starting to think through this. Right, and like those conversations are conversations that we could have been having before blockchain came around, right? Like this, these are ultimately collective decisions that we decide to make as an industry or as a, as a as country as, of voters or whatever it is in some cases. But for whatever reason, we just, those, those conversations haven't had the same traction as they do now. And it seems like the technology suddenly is the thing that has 
changed the scenario? And obviously, you're both involved in companies that like, address this very directly of finding new ways to use technology to help artists, creators support themselves. So is, was it just that we were waiting for the right technology all this time? Or is it that the fact that the technology exists and that the conversation has expanded so much in terms of the number of people who can see a work or who can support an artist, that that's expanded so much and so there are more people who care now than there used to be? Yeah, I, I think it's just an ongoing evolution um, that we're seeing where technology is, again, just breaking down these doors and providing access. And so, you know, you, I, I know people, I'm sure there's people in this room who have like found artists that they love and maybe went on to purchase a piece of their work. They found the artist on Instagram and they probably found it on the artist's Instagram, not on a gallery Instagram. Maybe they found it in the gallery, maybe museum or institution, but like through tools like Instagram, an artist can have a direct relationship with someone who loves their art. Um, and that gets multiplied across, you know, all the different technologies they've created. You've probably in the past year done a Zoom with an artist, which is like kind of amazing. I think one of the best things that came out of the pandemic is everybody has Zoom on their computer and everyone's totally comfortable. Like my 85 year old mother is pretty comfortable like firing up Zoom and doing a, doing a Zoom call, which two years ago, she would have been like, what are you talking about? Like video call sort of thing. Um, and so all these technologies as they just get into more and more hands, just allow just much better access between creators um, and whatever they might be, whether they're writers, whether they make film, whether they make fine art, um, and the audiences that they want to reach. And that audience is, is global, you know, is billions of people. And so I think it's just this kind of continued evolution. Um, and again, I think like, why are we starting to see that now? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's the same thing we're seeing with, you know, the NCAA, where they're, where the NCAA players, athletic college uh, athletes in the United States don't get paid. The schools get paid hundreds of millions of dollars, the coaches get paid tens of millions of dollars a year, and the players have to play for free. If they get money, they get kicked off the team. Uh, finally, this year, we're seeing that break loose. Like, it's crazy that literally, like, Notre Dame can sign a billion dollar contract with a television station, and the players can't take a penny. Um, and so, like, we're finally starting, there's, like, awareness built, there's the ability to actually have these direct relationships. The players have Instagrams, just like the artists have Instagrams. Um, and because we're starting to have those direct relationships, some of these like institutional, you know, gatekeepers and kind of longstanding rules that have been uh, just in place, probably to actually just help a lot of people make a lot of money, um, are starting starting to break down. Aside from the the Zoom aspect of things, like are there other ways that just your your day to day experience as supporters of artists have changed because of technology, specifically because of the pandemic? Because like, there's been a lot of conversation about how, oh, this is the moment that finally forced the traditionally tech-resistant art world to really level up its game and do all these things differently. And I don't know that there's as much evidence of that as, as we would like to believe that there is. So, but just from your own personal experience, because like, I'm not the one buying the art. Like, what, what else has changed? Is it just Zoom studio visits? You're finding more art on Instagram? What's, what's going on out there? I mean, I think one thing that has definitely changed for us and other um, kind of collectors and patrons that I know is, like, we buy off JPEGs now much more quickly, right? Where if you go back 10 years, it would have been people would have been very hesitant, like, okay, I've seen the picture. Like, I'm not going to drop the money unless I actually go physically see it in person. Um, and you come here today and you talk to the galleries and they're like, you know, I sold 20 pieces before the show opened, like sold, done. And then there's a bunch on reserve and like that, that kind of standard goes on. So I think that like level of familiarity. And if you think about what does that look like um, to fast forward to what I think we'll probably end up talking about, like you go 10 years from now and you can imagine the fair being like, no, no, we, we like we sold all the art. Of course we sold all the art. Like, like we've, it's been for sale for the past week. We've been sending out emails to people who want to buy the art. Um, and you can come and enjoy the art. Um, and so we've become personally much more comfortable with that. I do find it ironic that the galleries send PDFs. Like that's their, that's their model of communication is let me send you a PDF, which is like you theoretically are printing this out, but no one's printing it out. You're sitting on your phone on a PDF. So, uh, you know, it's taking a while to get there, but there's some great startups actually focused on like, how do we build technology for galleries that help them actually like 
manage their artwork, manage their collection, manage the communication with their, with their collectors and with their clients, which is like an obvious one. You think about what does your relationship with any company look like? It's usually not them sending you PDFs. Like you'd fire your bank if they were like, you know, you want to make a, make a payment, you're like, here's the PDF. Um, so I think we're going to see that continue to change. And then there's also been a lot of sort of secondary change that has come out of that in terms of like the amount of price transparency that you see now, just because now every gallery has an online viewing room and because they're putting out so much information on social media, through PDFs, through online viewing rooms, through art fairs, it's just there's, they just have to say more stuff than they used to in a lot of ways. And I generally see that as a good thing, that more, I, I've never, I've always been uncomfortable with the amount of information asymmetry between like, dealers and people who are interacting with dealers. Um, and same with auction houses and anywhere else. But uh, that seems like another sort of general good that's come out of this. And, and it's been like a virtuous cycle too. If you look at the numbers on the amount of artwork that has been sold online, just for people who like data, uh, in 2019, the three major auction houses, so Christie's, Sotheby's, and Phillips, collectively sold $95 million worth of art online. And in 2020, they collectively sold over a billion dollars uh, online. Um, so, like, kind of a major, major difference there, I would say. Uh, but again, this is, this is just sort of, I feel like, part of this way that you start talking about how technology changes one thing, and, and then it becomes a ripple effect. Like, something else ends up changing downstream because of that. And I don't know where this ends up ultimately. It's a big question. Obviously. Well, but I think a couple, I mean, what Ethan's describing of buying on JPEGs and buying on, you know, I think Discover, I mean, I think it's no accident you talk to a lot of collectors and they did a lot of buying during COVID. Now, you could say that that happened because you're sitting at home, but I actually think there was access to information. There were tools for discovery. I mean, the number of pieces that we sort of encountered on Instagram or through a story or following somebody and then asked what was available. Um, you buy, you know, buying on JPEGs or buying on PDFs is, is essentially like e-commerce sales, right? Like, like who is sitting in an auction room during the last 18 months? Very few people. Um, and even if you're buying on the phone, you're still kind of buying sort of digitally and techno technologically enabled. Maybe it was sent to you, maybe you saw it in person. Um, and the the adage or the the sort of you know greater transparency leads to confidence, leads to greater participation. Like holds true in every other. It holds true in in life. And you know I think the industry has it's in its evolution, right? Like it, it worked in the way of just having a select number of collectors in New York and in San Fran in in London and San Francisco and a select number of galleries. Um, the art world was seasonal like 10 years ago. You know, you had like a specific auction season and then you'd have a couple of art fairs and then everybody would go away for the summer and then like, but we're now in more than a 24 seven cycle. And so you need that proliferation of information in order for people to engage with it is going to require transparency if you're gonna actually reach a much wider audience. And I think that's what you're seeing you know, people have a confidence level of now saying, oh, okay, I know what 10,000 looks like, right? I know what 20,000 looks like. I know what 100,000 looks like. And by the way, like, I know what 20 million looks like. Um, and that feels, not that that's, the, but it's, you know, it's, you start to feel comfortable um, sort of understanding value brackets from that way. Definitely. And we are running out of time, so I will just sort of, bring us in for the landing on this question, which Ethan nodded to a little bit ago. So let's, let's just talk about the future in a more specific way. Let's say that we're back here in 2030. I would love for each of you to sort of just name one element that you hope that technology would change about the way that we all do this thing that we're doing right now, meaning supporting artists in one way or another, and, uh, and why you think it's important. 2030, I hope I'm back here in 2030. Um, <laughs> I was bummed not to be here last year. So, I mean, I, I do think we'll see continued evolution in the tools that we use. I don't think we're gonna be getting PDFs. Um, 
I think there's a decent chance that most artwork, like the provenance and certificate of authenticity of art moves to the blockchain, because it's just a better place. It's a public ledger. Um, and arguably the only thing that makes a piece of art valuable is the certificate of authenticity. Like if, if you think it's a fake, it's not worth, if there's a chance it's a fake, it's not worth very much. Um, and so that's like a very important thing that is like kind of just doesn't necessarily exist. I don't know, we have lots of art and we don't get certificates of authenticity, but I know if we need to, we'll call it a gallery, but that's like pretty awkward um, and doesn't really leverage technology very well. Uh, and the blockchain is built for that. Just like, okay, here's the piece, here's the authenticity. We can see the provenance forever. It doesn't go away. Um, you can see all of all the chains. So I think we're gonna continue to, uh, to see that. Um, and I think the fair, like I love coming to the fair because you get to see just unbelievable amounts of amazing art in person um, and I think that's the that's the value that I I and others I'm sure get and so I think like that's gonna continue to exist um, I think one question that we've been talking a little bit about is like is the artist's relationship with the fair going to change like will the artist be more present and in a different manner like we've bumped into some artists it's been great to see them but like, you know, they're, they're just kind of lounging around the booth or kind of chit-chatting, um, like the rest of us, I guess. But like, is there a place for the artist to have a, a more, formal is too strong a word, but like a clearer presence? Um, you know, are they on Twitter? Or are they doing a Facebook live stream? Or, the, you know, are they uh, in some way engaging with their audience, both at the fair and kind of around the fair, I think is, is something that we could see happen. So I totally, I'm gonna go, Ethan's um, comment about the PDFs, I, I would love. <laughs> I had two pieces that I saw yesterday and was fishing around for the PDF in my inbox and then the business card to figure out where. So I would, I would love just that to be dropped into my phone and um, have that be an easy communication. And yeah, no, I think this concept of like, of sort of, interfacing with the artist, whether again, this is, you know, a, a piece that's hanging in a booth and it's, I am co-investing with an artist in that. Um, I will be really excited if that's a model that is pervasive. Um, and then I think this idea of going to an event that is showcasing its platform for a creator and the giveaway is, an NFT, a project that they've created that's sort of part of their practice and sort of connects me to their body of work in perpetuity. And like, I will show up at Basel every year if that's sort of the, the model that we get to participate in. So, um, so I'm excited. 2030, is that what the promise is? Yeah. I mean, I would uh, say if you want to go crazy and push, I mean, 2030 is a long ways out, <laughs> but like we will see collective buying of very expensive pieces of art, right? So last week, a group of about, I don't know, 10 or 15,000 individuals in the course of six days raised $40 million to buy a copy of the U.S. Constitution at Sotheby's. Unfortunately, it didn't win the bid. Uh, anyone could participate. Like you just go to a website, you take Ethereum, you drop it in a smart contract, all the money's there, like no lawyer's time, no, no lawyers were paid, no bankers were paid, $40 million in an account to go bid on a piece of art. Like that's kind of crazy if you think about it. Um, like it would take, if you want to do that with lawyers and bankers, it would take you six months and a lot of money. Um, and so six days, so then you start to think like, okay, well like why does art need to be owned by an individual? Why can't it be collectively owned? Um, why can't uh, my relationship with an artist be expressed through, you know, either my monthly giving or my support is on a regular basis? Um, you know, the blockchain allows you to provably own something. Like, I can actually show, like, yes, I own this art. Like, do I need to be on the guest list to get into some party? It's just like, no, like, here's all my art. I don't wanna have to, like, talk to the phone, to, you know, deal with that whole thing. And, like, that, those relationships are now being built on blockchain. And the amazing thing about the blockchain is no one owns it and no one controls it. And so the things that I own the, on the blockchain, I own them, uh, they're mine. And I bought them from someone, you can see that relationship. And so I do think we'll start to see changing relationship built around ownership um, and built around patronage that, you know, that involves money, which is like, great, money is energy. That's like how we make things happen in the world. No, right, could you imagine if there was a major happening that was happening you know, on the beach, a major sculpture, and people all over the world were like phoning in, being like, I'm buying it, I'm buying it. Yeah, that's like, cool. yeah, it's gonna be really fun. Well, a lot, we'll 
I guess uh, we'll have a lot of uh, interesting things to look forward to, but Sarah, if either you or anybody else you know gets a PDF in 2030, I think Ethan <laughs> owes both of us a drink. So <laughs> we'll end it on that. I think we have some time for some audience questions. Let's just raise your hand. We have some microphones going around. And this gentleman in the back I saw first, so go with him. So the question is, uh, how will NFTs be used to sell both physical art as well as digital art? Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, so we're seeing some of this. Like Tom Sachs, for example, uh, is an artist where you buy NFTs. They're basically like different pieces of a rocket. And you, if you buy three pieces of the rocket, you can take them to like the rocket factory, build them into a, he'll, he, they, the team, will take, build a rocket, launch it up into the sky, film it. When it crashes to Earth, they'll pick it up, they'll send you the crashed rocket and the video of your rocket, so it's kind of a, a three-piece there. Um, so we're seeing artists start to explore that. Um, I mean, I will say, having worked in cryptocurrency for a long time, like where cryptocurrency is hard is where it meets like, the real world. Um, so like the hardest thing about cryptocurrency, just broadly, is actually like getting your hands on it. Like You got to show your driver's license and connect bank accounts, and I was like, once you have it, like you can go put money into this constitution thing in, in like two seconds. But like, so where crypto meets the real world is where things are much harder, but it's where there's a ton of effort and energy going in to actually solve some of those things. And I'll just add on, there's a, a, an artist working on a project right now that you know, it, it really using tokens to retain ownership, right? And, and the idea of actually being able to, because all of a sudden when you're not selling 100% um, of something, you need some sort of a smart contract or governing you know, ledger system that is trustless and, and transparent to say, actually, you only own 60% and not 80%. So I think you're seeing some of those experiments happen as well, really powerfully. Picking up on two things that were discussed, one is democratization and the other is where the benefits to the artist ultimately lie when things are either donated or resold. On democratization, I'm wondering because over the last quarter century, I have bought many more bottles of wine than pieces of art. Isn't that really an old model? You don't buy the whole vineyard. Everyone who buys one of the 60,000 bottles in the 500 cases of Screaming Eagle each year gets the same thing. And likewise, if it was 50,000 cases, you just add zeros. But everybody gets to say, I've owned it. I've experienced it. I've shared it with friends. So I wonder if we'd come at it from the wine buying model, would this seem less alien to us? Uh, love your reactions to that. And the other is, I think that the model, perhaps, for uh, making sure that the artists benefit in the long term is the ASCAP model as it relates to music. Who owns the masters? Who owns the songs? And I wonder if technology might make it easier for through the sales of NFTs and so forth to codify the permanent ownership of the intellectual property by the creator. Great questions. I also have bought a lot more wine than I have art in my life. Um, so I think there's probably something around the consumption that's a little, little different there. Um, I mean, I do think s there's interesting models around, let's just call it subscriptions. That's kind of like a, a lame way to, to put it. Um, but it, thinking about like ongoing support. Um, and we do see some of this, like uh, we were at the Rubel Museum yesterday, which you should absolutely go check out while you're here. Amazing work. You know, they have an artist in residence program and they're hanging the last three or four years. Um, and so clearly there's like, you know, ongoing commitment to support artists, probably young artists mostly, that are like early in their career and need money to actually like survive. Um, and one can imagine that world where like lots of people in this room would probably give a small amount of money every month. And like that actually makes a huge difference to, you know, giving an artist like $5,000 or $10,000 once and you're like, okay, I gotta, I'm either gonna spend it all and hope for the more. But if you know that you're like, you know, kind of base money is covered for, years and years, it allows you to pre approach your creative work in just like a completely different manner. Uh, and we're seeing this across, you know, there's a website called Patreon where there's all kinds of very interesting creators going on. Um, and I think we'll continue to see that more and more with the artist world. But it is a little, a little foreign. Um, 
I think on your point around ASCAP, I mean, one of the things that I find most exciting about NFTs is that royalties are built into the smart contract. And so literally, like, the money has to be shared with the artist, and the artist gets to choose what that percentage looks like. Um, and that's just, it's just part of the way the business is done, where, um, which I think is, like, obvious. We talked earlier about that, that our, obviously artists should be sharing in royalties of, of their work on an ongoing basis. Yes, in the back. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering if somebody could explain a little bit about the Studio Drift piece um, at Pace. It's an AR NFT, and I know it's sold, but is it, does it work in the same way um, as a normal NFT where everybody can buy them because it was sold once for 500 Like, I got, maybe I'm just out of the loop, but I got a little confused. I can, I, fortunately, I just wrote about the Cessors, so oh, great. I can answer this. Oh, by the way, you look a lot younger than you read. It's very nice to put a I, name to a face. I adore your column. Oh, oh, thank you. Thank you so much, yes. And I get that all the time about how, how young I look, uh, which I would always rather have that than the opposite. But so the, the Studio Drift piece is a, it's a, a three-part piece, essentially. So there is... There is an NFT that is connected to a digital video that if you go down to the booth is playing on an iPad that's installed on the wall next to the sculptural component of the piece, which is like an array of kind of rectangular objects that emit light in some capacity. And then the third component is the augmented reality aspect, which is activated by the sculptural component. So like you can't look at the AR piece unless the sculptural piece is there. But if you do have the sculptural piece there and you have the software on your smartphone, which I think it's a proprietary thing that you only get access to if you own the piece, I'm not 100% sure about that part, but at that point you can just look through your phone, look through an iPad, and you will get an augmented reality experience that's sort of overlaid on top of the physical sculpture. So that's, that's kind of the scenario there. But you're right. The, the NFT is unique. It was, to my knowledge, only a, like it wasn't fractionalized in any way. So the single buyer of all three of those aspects of the piece is the only one who owns it. And I think that's pretty much where it stops. Would, yeah, would one of you like to? I don't either. Yeah. It's, yeah, like, it's, it's, the, this is the thing, like, the NFT is never the artwork, and unlike in, in almost any cases, it's something else that is connected to the artwork. It's, um, it's a little reductive to talk about it this way, but it is, in some sense, like a digital certificate of authenticity. So, yeah, that's, that's like a commonly misunderstood thing about NFTs versus what they're connected with. Like, people will say, like, oh, they just, they, they sold the NFT for this. It's like, well, but the NFT comes with something else, usually. So like the Beeple that sold for $69 million, people are like, the Beeple NFT sold for $69 million. It's like, well, the digital collage has an NFT connected to it, and that package of things together sold for $69 million. If you're just buying the NFT, you're just basically buying like a certificate. Hi, I've been following the Facebook Live comments and there's lots of excitement and interest around NFTs. And one question that came in was around the environmental impact of NFTs. And um, uh, as a collector and as a patron of uh, NFTs, uh, how have you been addressing this uh, subject? Yeah, so uh, the best way for me to, blockchains are super complicated, cryptocurrency, we can spend, you can spend years learning about it. Um, the way that I think about kind of the, and the environment, environmental impact is real for the Bitcoin blockchain, for the Ethereum blockchain. There is lots of effort and energy going into actually making that not the case. Um, the way that I like to think about this is like that was the first version. We created it, you know, eight, ten years ago. It's super inefficient, and the are lots of smart people working to make it more efficient. And then there are lots of new blockchains coming out that are exceptionally efficient. Um, so. You know, we will have, and like my company, for example, builds on blockchains that are like basically have zero carbon uh, footprint. Um, so there is that out there. Um, you know, I mean, I guess one question that we look at also is like, how much would you pay to secure a sixty million dollar piece of artwork? Right? Well, you probably pay a fair amount. How much do you secure to like have a global financial economy? It's probably a lot. Like, it's 
think how much we're burning on watching TikTok videos. I mean, you want to talk about carbon footprint. Like, I mean, it's just like millions of servers pumping out videos for our kids to just like flick through all the time. So, I mean, it's a trade off. I'm not trying to say that it's like it should be ignored, but there are steps that are being taken to make it better. And then there are trade offs that we make as a society as to like, what do we want to burn dead dinosaurs up for? Like, what's important to us? Keeping the lights on here is important. You know, watching TikTok is apparently important, and securing money is probably important also. And I think the, one of the most encouraging things I think about the space is that, like, you know, sort of adoption is driving innovation very rapidly. And so I think you are seeing, you know, it, it, people that are building on top of different chains, like, they're going to move to the more energy efficient chains for a variety of reasons. Um, and I think it's really exciting because I think there's kind of like an arms race of creating the best and most efficient chain. And it's kind of like building the supercomputer at first, like it took yeah. up a whole room. And there's now also, it's kind of interesting in that uh, if you have very cheap and efficient energy, let's just say like somewhere, I don't know, like up in the, like Siberia or something where you're just like, hey, thermal energy, this stuff is really cheap. It's actually very expensive. You can't really transport that energy to like Miami. Like it's very hard to move the electricity here, uh, but you can move blockchain computation like the blockchain doesn't care where the computation takes place. So what you've actually seen is that the computers that operate the blockchain end up going to places with very, very efficient energy, of course, because you don't want to spend a lot of money. And so actually we're able to tap into highly efficient energy that's frequently in places that it, there's no consumption, there's no demand for, because energy, electricity is not particularly movable, whereas like computation of a blockchain can take place any place on the planet. And just for the comments on Facebook though, I think it's keep keep asking them because I think yeah. it's, it's, what's, it's, it's what's moving moving everybody's roadmap ahead and priorities. Yeah, definitely. Which is awesome. I think that we are, Emily, do we have time for one more? Okay. Uh, I will go with you in the crimson shirt. Oh, I'm just wondering how this conversation applies to like, public collection. Oh, sorry. I'm wondering how... Oh, this uh, conversation applies to public collections and kind of, we talk about democratization a lot. From my understanding, kind of its role within private settings and transactions and allowing everybody to be part of a private transaction, I guess. But I'm wondering how this changes public collections, relationships to public collections and ownership of public collections. And when you say public collections, meaning, what do you, can you clarify what that means? I mean, everything from uh, public art, so like even statues and uh, like a public collection that a city might have to um, yeah, uh, even a public museum. So institutions or objects, really. Yeah, I mean, I would, again, not to nerd out too much on crypto, but I do think like the, um, the ability, the democratization of money, in essence, is what cryptocurrency does, where anybody can have money and can send it to anyone else on the planet or contribute it to a project, I actually think can change public art, absolutely. You know, if we can raise $40 million to buy it, and the, the people who put money into buying the Constitution explicitly were like, we want this to be publicly displayed. Like, the goal was buy it, put it in public, take it out, it was the last, last version in private hands, like, take it out of private hands, it's now still in private hands, but like, put it in some place where it can be public. And so you can completely imagine, um, whether it's an artist-driven or a city or you know, some sort of locale saying like, hey, let's put this beautiful art you know, in a public place. Um, and being able to gather those funds and finances from people all over, the, all over the globe, frankly. So I think there's a lot of interesting things that can happen there. And I'll just add to that. I think it's going to really, really change just basically philanthropy. Um, and you know, this idea of, uh, of being able to own a de minimis piece of an artwork that might be sitting in a museum or of a major cultural artifact, um, you know, whether that's a conservation fund or whatnot, like it, you know, it's gonna take some bold thinkers to be comfortable with that model. Um, but you're gonna you're gonna see an entirely different relationship. I mean, imagine if your museum membership actually like got you a basis point of a basis point of a basis point of a painting, and all of a sudden you're bringing your family and your friends in to visit your painting. Um, and I, I just think like we're moving in that direction. Um, there are conversations that are happening um, with cultural institutions right now. Um, you know, it's, there, there's a lot of risk aversion and in sort of wondering what that might look like, but I think um, 
it's going to be, I think it'll be really exciting. Yeah. And I think one of the first places you'll see it, because it's like drop dead simple, is, you know, so much kind of philanthropy is for like, get your name on the wall next to the, in the gallery, or, you know, like, kind of like you get some credit for these things, or you like, go to some dinner, or they give you some swag bag. Like, oftentimes it's stuff you don't, like, who wants the swag bag? Like, they keep giving you the swag bag. Um, and it's like some thing that sits on your desk for some period of time until it ends up in a box, and then it goes into a landfill. Um, that those things could be expressed digitally, like, exceptionally well. Um, and like, you know, supporting something where like, okay, I have the NFT, I have it forever, I don't have to hold on to it. Like, I, I don't, can't lose it, it's not possible to lose. Um, but it's also publicly displayed. So I can actually, you know, if I'm proud of the fact that I supported a piece of art that went up, that my ownership as expressed as an NFT can be visible to the entire world. Um, so unlike my name on the side of the statue, which is like really hard for somebody to see, um, or like my swag bag or like the t-shirt that I wear, um, it's, it's globally and publicly available for anyone to see. So I think there's a real opportunity to actually tap into, um, you know, people give because they want to support, but they also like recognition and NFTs are a wonderful form of recognition. All right, I think we are gonna have to leave it there. Sarah, Ethan, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Everybody in the thank audience, you. enjoy the rest of the fair.